So I'm not sure if I should start this video by thanking or cursing Jeff from Craft Computing for inspiring me to try this project, but definitely check out the link in the description to his uh, playlist for his his uh, cloud gaming server builds that he did. I kind of am replicating what he's doing, but in a different way. I decided to see if I could use the Tesla cards to do Oculus PC VR gaming. I initially started with the K80 because I liked the dual GPUs on the card, but um, despite the K80 being decent for gaming, it's not compatible with uh, PC VR, at least not PC VR I'm trying to do, which is Oculus Air Link. And in my case, what I determined was the K80 is not capable of doing PC VR with Air Link because the K80 lacks the uh, video encoding capabilities required. Um, the K80 doesn't support basically any kind of video encoding, but I did find that it somehow is able to stream 1080p 30fps. It will not do 60 though. If you try to stream 60, it uh, it just breaks everything. I haven't tried 720p 60, but the K80 is probably going to be getting sold now that I have a pair of Tesla M40s. The Tesla M40 is capable of PC VR because it supports uh, H.264 and H.265 encoding which is nice. I did find it to be a little stuttery, but overall I was pleasantly surprised. I haven't tried too many games yet since I uh, was just trying free ones. I do have some stuff in my Steam library, but I haven't had time to figure out how Steam VR works, uh, how to set it up. Plus being that I'm doing this on a virtual machine might make it a little more challenging. <laughs> um, but yeah, so with like VR games that are actual VR games, this card did have some issues. It was a little stuttery and jittery. But when it came to playing VR games that were basically flat games on a PC headset, or a VR headset, I mean, it didn't really seem like there was any issues. I can't speak for latency issues since I haven't quite figured out what my latency issues are. I don't think it's my network necessarily, since uh, everything's wired up to the access point. The access point is on the other side of a wall from my VR room. So that's something where I'm kicking around the possibility of maybe moving my wireless access point in my VR room and then just adding another access point to my office. But that's kind of work in progress. I also wonder um, if the R720 is bottlenecking my GPU or not. I haven't quite figured out why, but on the virtual machine with the, um, the Tech Power Up GPU Z utility, it was reporting the card as a PCI Express X32 2.0, which I'm not quite sure how that works because with these risers, they are 3.0 rated. Gen 3. Um, oddly enough, I think these risers are lower end than the ones that are in my server right now. Let me see this riser. So this one supports X16. So I don't know if uh, GPU-Z is maybe pulling not the card's actual connection, but maybe it's pulling from the riser and thinking that it's the 32 lane slot that I have the card in. Um, from a power standpoint, that was an interesting caveat. I've done some other videos on it already. Since these are not PCI Express power, but they're EPS 12 volt, I had to make my own custom cable. You can buy an aftermarket power cable that'll go to two PCI Express 8 pins and then buy 
the adapter that goes from those two PCI Express 8 pins to um, to a, uh, a 12 volt EPS, but it just makes a giant cable mess, which I'm not a big fan of. So I've just decided to make my own cables. I have found some cables on eBay that might be correct for this card, but the problem is they don't show the wiring very well. So that's a little bit of a disappointment. Um, not that I can, I mean, I can just make my own, so it's not a big deal for me, but for other people that don't want to make their own cables, then that might be a bit of a problem. But overall, it's been it's been a fun experience. It's definitely better than the RX 580 I was using and in my gaming PC for my VR room because the RX 580 was just a 4 gig card and it seemed like it just wasn't powerful enough. It was a lot more stuttery and worse than this card was. Um plus since I like to keep my temps cool even at high speeds, that that card was getting to the seventies. Not to say that this one isn't getting that that hot either, but um, the RX five eighty was running hot, and then having all the fans at high speed, and that got noisy and annoying. Versus this, if I want to crank up the fans, which I need to do, I need to learn how to use the IPMI interface to change fan speeds. But if I want to crank up the fans, this server that I use is basically in another room across across my office so yeah it's uh it's definitely nice plus I plan on virtualizing my desktop onto the server eventually I'm still working on that um and then I also like the fact that I can do video editing uh whether I'm at home or my office on a machine that's not like my primary machine, so it's out of my way and it's off to the side. So virtualization definitely has its benefits. I do wish that I didn't have to take up both card slots for for the card, but that's just kind of unavoidable considering the TDP that these are rated for. Uh, I believe Without looking it up off the top of my head, I believe this card is rated for 250 watts versus the K80, which is 300 watts. But yeah, I will attach some clips of me playing some PC VR just to show what the experience is like and then the system modes. So this is the Echo Arena lobby. Overall, it didn't feel too jittery. It was fairly smooth. The utilization was on average around 65% GPU load, 6 to 7 gigabytes of GPU memory, and then the power utilization was generally around 150 watts. And this was with the maximum visual settings on. You will see a few spikes in the GPU load, but for the most part, things were pretty consistent. Here where I start interacting with the terminal, there is a reasonable spike. I believe it's because I'm interacting with the terminal, but also moving around at the same time. And then when I tried shooting, I had some issues. I don't know if it was skill or latency, but I'm leaning more towards the latency was having difficulty than anything else. And the few good hits I did get off, I don't know if those were just kind of luck or if there was some skill involved there. But overall in the lobby, the experience wasn't terrible. So this clip is an AI match that I did. This was on lowest settings. 
And I also did have the task manager open just to kind of keep an eye on what the CPU utilization is. This virtual machine has eight virtual cores at uh, 2.4 gigahertz each. Also, the temperatures were a little bit higher on the GPU since I had been playing for a little bit at this point. Really, I didn't notice any improvement in dropping the visual quality. It saved me a gigabyte of uh, GPU memory and I still had latency issues. I uh, did not feel very responsive and when I did move I didn't feel like the game was doing the same thing I was at the same time. It was playable but this is definitely not good for if you're trying to play competitive. I think it might be better if I was on wired, but the whole point of uh, this cloud gaming server is the idea that I can have the server in another room. One thing I might try is getting a uh, USB 3 to network adapter and then sending that to my VR room and then seeing if I can do Oculus Link that way. But overall, this was a little bit more disappointing out of the uh, lobby, compared to the lobby experience. So this game was Vroom Kaboom. I felt like it was more of a flat game ported over to a VR headset wasn't quite as immersive as Echo VR was. Overall, it seemed to run well over AirLink. I didn't have any noticeable latency or lag issues. I do think this was designed for the Rift, so I ran into some, some issues where I couldn't figure out how to do certain things that the tutorial wanted me to do. And I'm not sure if it's because the Quest 2 controllers were lacking something that was required that's normally on a Rift controller. Or if I just didn't understand what I was supposed to do correctly. Like I said, the utilization wasn't terrible. As you can see, it's staying fairly consistent around a 50% GPU load and 5 gigs of GPU memory. Temperatures are a little higher since I've already been playing for a bit. This card is rated for 90 Celsius, I believe, for its maximum operating temperature. And I never really noticed any uh, performance issues due to its current temps. And I forget what I saw when I looked through the logs, but I don't think GPU-Z caught any perf caps for any of my gaming sessions. So, that's a plus. Overall, it's an interesting game though. I, uh, never did more than tutorial, but maybe I might try more of it down the road. So hopefully those clips were interesting and kind of showed the capabilities of this card related to VR. Whether or not this is worth doing, I don't know. It really depends on how big of a project you're willing to take on and the caveats that come with it. I feel that since I'm doing this in a virtual environment versus trying to do a GPU pass-through on a desktop, it's a little bit easier for me. Uh, at the same time, it was a little bit harder, but it was easier because I wasn't trying to figure out how to get this card to pass through to my internal graphics. I just set it up as a virtual machine and then used Parsec as a remote access client uh, along with that USB video driver. I would say that if you already have a server in your home lab that has GPU support, it would be more viable or if you plan on building like a home lab but I don't feel it's something I'd recommend trying 
to do in like a gaming desktop. I haven't tried the steps to see what would happen if I were to put this in a more traditional desktop. It's not something I'm interested in just because I don't have to deal with the um, troubles that come with cooling this thing. But for the money, if if you're willing to take on such a challenging project, I think it definitely pays off because I don't think you can get this much GPU power for 175 or less right now. Because even uh, 1066 gig, those cards are running anywhere between two and three hundred dollars, depending on which ones you're buying, which is kind of rough and. They're not quite as powerful as this. You do get some advantages with the 1060 because then you have outputs and you don't have to fiddle around with a bunch of crazy stuff. But this has a lot more GPU memory, which helps. Plus it's a little bit more capable um, from a home lab standpoint versus the GPU. I find it a lot easier to switch between virtual machines with this card versus, um, you know, doing like a multi-boot setup or swapping out hard drives or moving the card around. If I have this card in the server, basically my options are unlimited. I just have to make sure that if I want to boot up a different virtual machine, that I shut down the virtual machine that's using the card. But yeah, hopefully you found that interesting and thanks for watching.